we're going to just pick our way through a little of the beginning of this. And when you open up a book, sometimes you just have to start and, you know, go word for word and say, all right, now, what the hell is this? What's going on here? The first thing you see when you open up a book, you don't even have to open it. The title, uh, Arunico or The Royal Slave. That's uh, two words slapped together you don't normally see. This is a pretty good title that way. <laughs> uh, if, if you're scanning through a, a shelf or a bookstall or something like that, and you see the royal slave, uh, those two ideas are going to collide rather violently in your imagination, and you might be more inclined to pick it out. Hey, what's that? I don't normally think of slaves as royal. Let's see. Uh, so, yeah, okay. And then you see the, the sub-headline, the history of the royal slave. The history. Now, history is going to have a slightly different sense in, the earlier, uh, in, in earlier history than we know it. But a history tells you or hints to you that this is true. This is not something that she's just making up. It was very important to uh, to early readers and writers, since they didn't really understand what a novel was, uh, they didn't really get the, the fiction aspect of it. If it's written in prose, it must be some kind of reportage, right? It must be true. And writers would sort of play off that a little bit. You know, it's never, it's never something that they uh, that they're just making up out of their minds, but that it has some anchor in fact, some anchor in truth, and that is the great selling point for them. Take a look at the very beginning. I do not pretend in giving you the history of this royal slave to entertain my reader with the advantages of a feigned hero whose life and fortune's fancy may manage at the poet's pleasure, nor in relating the truth designed to adorn it with any accidents, but such as arrived in earnest to him, and it shall come simply into the world recommended by its own proper merits and natural intrigues, there being enough of reality to support it and to render it diverting without, any, without the addition of invention. So here she is saying rather explicitly that this is all true without the addition of invention, uh, but uh, we don't want you even to think about that too much. So we're just going to put this out there as a quick verification, and then let's just move on. I was myself an eyewitness to a great part of what you'll find here set down, and what I could not be witness of, I received from the mouth of that chief actor of the history, the hero himself, who gave us the whole transactions of his youth, and though I shall admit for brevity's sake a thousand little accidents of his life, which, however pleasant to us, where history was scarce and adventure very rare, yet might prove tedious and heavy to my reader, in a world where he finds diversions for every minute new and strange. But we who were perfectly charmed with the character of this great man were curious to gather every circumstance of his life. She's kind of explaining her mode of operation here. She's trying to tell people what she is doing. But at the same time, she is very conscious that people are... Uh, going to be a little skeptical, and she needs to get over that hurdle. She needs to demonstrate that. Well, yeah, this is all true. You can take uh, you can take all this uh, uh, as as verifiable truth, and I have done very little to change it. Yes, okay, I've skipped over some parts. I've left some stuff out, which is an example of art, which is an example of artifice. When you start selecting certain things from any story and suppressing others, then it's no longer necessarily true objectively. It is an arrangement of truth. And that's a troubling line that the novel is trying to work out here. And here the novelist is trying to work out. But you can see how 
conscious she is of her reader in that one line, yet might prove tedious and heavy to my reader in a world where he finds diversions for every minute new and strange. She knows that readers are going to have a short attention span. She knows that perhaps her readers specifically have short attention spans. And I will recall to you some of her uh some of her poetry and the uh the the basic biography of her life where she was very much involved in a kind of decadent movement in the uh in the very luxurious royalist tradition of uh fun and she knows that her readers, her friends, who are probably the first people to read this, her friends are going to be, you know, uh, well, I could sit here and read this book, or I can go over there and, hey, there's an orgy taking place in the next room. Uh, this is what she's dealing with. She was a good friend of the Earl of Rochester, who was a notorious libertine, and she knows exactly what she has to, uh, has to compete with in terms of attention span. So she is very, very conscious of that, and most authors of the time are. Because, again, people are just picking this up. They don't know what to make of it. The scene of the last part of his adventure lies in a colony in America called Suriname in the West Indies. She puts that right up close. And we're not even there yet. The, she admits eh, the second part will be taking place in Suriname. But that's the selling point, or that's one of the selling points of this story, is the exotic locale, the faraway land that she is going to describe as an eyewitness. So she sells it up top. This is all basic salesmanship going on here. But before I give you the story of this gallant slave, again, gallant, hmm, and slave, Two words you don't expect to find together. Tis fit, I tell you, the manner of bringing them to these new colonies for those they make use of there. And then she goes in to describe what is known to historians as the triangle trade, where ships would leave, uh, let's say, English ports, go to the western coast of Africa, steal human beings, in some cases buy them from, from leaders there who would have taken them as prisoners of war or something like that, and then fill up the ships with, uh, with human beings, sail them across the ocean to the so-called New World, sell the slaves, sell them as slaves, load up with lots of natural resources, lots of gold if they can get it, and then go back to England where they can unload all of that stuff, the gold, everybody wants gold, but natural resources as well, wood and timber and fruits and whatever would not spoil on the ride over, that would then uh, get fed into the, uh, the growing market in, in England, especially, especially in the, the early days of the Industrial Revolution, which this is essentially kicking off, where they need stuff like um, where they need stuff like uh, materials to make manufactured goods out of. So, right after teasing this exotic locale of ooh Suriname, then she's giving us this weird little history lesson. She's trying to orient the reader and say, okay, well this is what's going on here, but it's this curious little transition, which I know she's a little clunky at sometimes, it's this curious little transition from the tease of Suriname to the fact-based dictionary definition of the triangle trade. And in a way, it's a kind of example, well, it's an example of the spoonful of sugar. The spoonful of sugar is that tease of the exotic locale that you really lean into, and it's so short right there, but then you get the medicine going down, the medicine of this, uh, this practice that is quite horrifying. Now, you get in that, however, even more 
teasing of a sort, a kind of exoticism. You get the culture of them, trading with them for fish, venison, buffalo skins, and little rarities as marmosets, a sort of monkey as big as a rat or a weasel, but of a, a marvelous and delicate shape, and as a face and hands like a humane creature, and coucheries, a little beast in the form and fashion of a lion, as big as a kitten, but so exactly made in all parts like that of a noble beast that is in miniature, then for little parakeetos, little great parrots, macaws, and a thousand other birds and beasts of wonderful and surprising forms, shapes, and colors. This is uh, exoticism. This is another tease saying, you want to read this? You want to see all of this stuff? You want to know about all of the exotic stuff where I can take you to? Just keep reading. Just hold on. I will show you all of this. Now, in a way, there is a, well, exoticism is not a new storytelling uh, device, not a new device in teasing or salesmanship. It does fall under the category of what comes to be known as Orientalism, where uh, all of, uh, all of non- Western European culture gets classed in a kind of reductive uh, glitz where it's used for its mystery, for its exoticism, and is used as a kind of seduction tool. But in that, it is kind of reductive. It is, you can say that, well, this is a celebration of everything that is to be found in that culture, but it is also a a uh, limitation of it. It's not a rounded, full, complete picture of anything. It's a very selective one to celebrate the kind of sensuality of a, uh, of, of a given culture. And that's something to be aware of that is very much going on here, where she is writing to a predominantly English audience uh, about the exotic, faraway places and all of those you know, adorable little people. <laughs> the, uh, the, the character of the people themselves have a share in that, in that they're painted in almost Edenic uh, uh, simplicity of perfection, Edenic like Adam and Eve. It is explicitly referenced, the men wearing a long stripe of linen, which they deal with us for. They thread these beads also on long cotton threads and make girdles to tie their aprons to, which come 20 times or more about the waist, and then cross like a shoulder belt both ways and round their backs, arms, and legs. This adornment with their long black hair and their face painted in little specks or flowers here or there, makes him a wonderful figure to behold. Some of the beauties, beauties is generally meaning women, some of the beauties which indeed are finely shaped they are uh, as almost all are and who have pretty features and some very charming and novel for they have all that is called beauty except the color which is reddish yellow. Now, a couple things there. Uh, this is extolling the beauty of the natives of Suriname, the beauties of the natives of South America generally, uh, the, the beauty of this people. So you, you can hang your hat on that and say, well, okay, this is saying, hey, it's a different version of black is beautiful. But then there's that, uh, that little twist at the end all that is called beauty except the color, which is a reddish yellow. Obviously, that's a little twist at the end. And if you were uh, editing this to appeal to a certain audience, you might strike that out because it's kind of a, you know, an awkward left turn. But again, she is writing and you can... I'm not going to say what her personal beliefs were or anything on, on, on race... But I think you can deduce an awful lot from this story. 
but here she does come down very firmly on the uh, there are standards of beauty outside of our own narrow scope here in you know uh, 17th century England but she's still writing a popular work she might be using this to appeal to an audience who is perhaps a little bit more prejudiced on these matters or she might be using it to well as a spoonful of sugar. Hold those people close. Hold those readers who are going to be hesitating at this point close and say, well, okay, you know, well, well we all know that, you know, that, uh, uh, white is the only really pretty color. Uh, but so much of the story that's going to unfold will undermine that. So much of the story that's going to unfold will challenge that directly and indirectly. So maybe by, you know, keep your friends close and your enemies closer, by bringing those readers in, those readers who are going to be most resistant to that argument that, you know, uh, there are more than one col there is more than one color of, uh, of beauty, you got to bring those people in on board in this project and everything in this first couple of pages is about bringing the readers on board, bringing them in and convincing them that, ah, uh, you're not going to, uh, challenge them too much. You're going to basically support their side and slowly after making them feel comfortable you can start to change their mind you cannot change someone's mind unless you get them to invest in you and i will point out that biographically afroben comes out of the royal court system she was a diplomat at one time for the royal court actually really more of a spy most uh, historians agree we don't know that much about her again but she is this so she is very well aware that in order to curry favor with someone sometimes you pretend to be their friend and only by pretending to be their friend and once you have established that relationship can you really get them to do and think as you want them to. <clears throat> so I think that's what's going on here. There is a uh, remarkable agenda in these opening pages where she is uh, laying out, uh, she, she, She's not getting right to the story as modern readers would expect of a modern novel, but she is laying out an agenda for what she is trying to do and trying to get everybody together on the same project. And in those moments, which are very easy to skim past and very easy to just, you know, all right, wait until I... Where's the word Arunico? I know this is titled Arunico, so the story officially begins with the first appearance of that, so let me just skip all this and get to that. But if you just slow down and pick through these things and start to think, well, why am I being told this? Why am I being told that? It starts to take on a much richer complexion. They are extreme, modest, and bashful, very shy and nice of being touched, and though they are all thus naked, if one lives forever among them, there is not there is not to be seen an indecent action or glance or being continually used used to see one another so adorned so unadorned. So like our first parents before the fall, it seems as if they had no wishes. There being nothing to heighten curiosity, but all you can see, you see at once, and every moment see, and where there is no novelty there can be no curiosity. Continuing with that discussion of Adam and Eve, continuing with that discussion of the simplicity of the people, the exoticism of the people, uh, the biblical character of the people, 
very, very explicitly being made here, but also uh, playing on a couple of different levels. Uh, she is, after all, in these first couple of paragraphs here, talking about a bunch of people running around naked, or at least in very skimpy uh, stages of dress. And, you know, if you want to get people to keep turning the pages, you hint at them that, well, you know, uh, I might be talking about naked people. Uh, it's, it, it is not a new form of, uh, of salesmanship here. Um, <clears throat> but the character in which that it is being presented is, I think, interesting because she's saying that, well, yeah, people are running around naked and it's not that big of a deal. You see it every day. So you're not all that interested. Uh, what's the big deal? Yes. That person is naked from the waist up, and it's a guy, so nobody really cares. And that person is also naked from the waist up, and that's a woman. But, you know, suddenly we should be so outraged. It's silly, right? Notice how she's already setting the stage for these little gender distinctions here. But also that curious line... Where there is no novelty, there can be no curiosity. Where you can read a defense of her libertine background here. Uh, just like she, you know, hinted that, hey, I know everybody's got better things to do and more interesting things to do are popping up every minute. And we as modern readers with access to, you know, the internet certainly know about that. But here... Where there can be no novelty, there can be no curiosity. She is defending, well, she's defending uh, scanning. She is defending following your instincts. Like, ooh, that's interesting. Ooh, that's interesting. That's interesting. That's interesting. Because it engenders curiosity. Because it causes you to think. It's not just a passive thing where, ooh, something, ooh, something, ooh, something. But it's something, or it's a phenomenon that you have to lean into and say, wow, what is going on there? So that is also a product of, or a primary characteristic of, the developing novel. The novel makes its, uh, makes its case as something that is always serving up something new. You turn the pages to find out what's going to happen next. What's next? What's next? And that feeds curiosity. So she's defending the uh, she's defending the medium in which she's inventing, and at the same time pointing to the instinct of curiosity and the expansion of one's reason, the exercise of one's reason. <clears throat> which is pointing us to the uh, further down the line to the Enlightenment. So all of this is being jumbled around. All of this is being mixed up in these first pages to try and set the stage for this story to take place. There's no rush to get to the story in those first pages because she is trying to she is trying to explain the form in which the story is going to take place, which is uh, a very new thing, and nobody really knows. So by establishing her voice, by establishing an authorial voice, a particularly female authorial voice at that, she is saying that it's not just about the story, which we'll get to, but it's about the telling the telling of the story is as important as the story itself. The way it is told, not just the what of what is being told, is what really matters here. So this is, uh, well, this is uh, warming up for the story itself. And the story itself gets underway soon enough where we are, we are told rather controversially that the triangle trade did 
in fact, involve the sale of captured slaves and prisoners of war by the captors, by the victors, by other, in, in this case, by other, uh, by the aristocrats of these other, uh, uh, other kingdoms. They were always going to war with one another. They would capture a bunch of uh, the enemy combatants, bring them back home. They're prisoners of war. And basically, they would be used as slaves or sold as slaves. Lots of controversy around that, which we don't really need to go into. But that's what's being uh, argued here. Those then whom we make use of to work in our plantations of sugar are Negroes, black slaves altogether, which are transported thither in this manner. Making clear that we're talking about Africans, black Africans. She's discussed a little bit the, uh, the, 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 the people of Suriname, the natives there, but now she is transporting uh, us exactly to Africa. And the character of the world that we are introduced to in, uh, in West Africa is kind of familiar, especially to uh, Afrobend's readers, where it is a very well-established uh, kingdom. There is a very well-established aristocracy. There is a, a great deal of wealth, a great deal of culture. Uh, and it's a, it's a fairly orderly society in that <clears throat> it is in its way. You can read this a number of different ways, but it is in its way, a parallel universe to Europe where there are established hierarchies. There are established monarchies, uh, where there is a kind of, uh, luxurious culture, around the monarchies. Again, think of the libertinism of, uh, 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 of Afrobend's uh, uh, cohorts in the, uh, the early days of the Restoration. And by showing this, she is again uh, placating her reader and seducing her reader, I would argue, into a comfortable perspective of, oh, isn't that nice? It's sort of familiar, but it's, you know, it's not quite us. So they can get swept up in the, uh, the exoticism of it and not necessarily dwell so much on the familiarity of it because the problems are equally familiar. There is a, an old king uh, who's, uh, who, who is revered and whose sons all die in battle. Heroically, uh, they are all celebrated for, uh, for their valor. Uh, it is a full-throated endorsement of aristocracy. Uh, from the Tory Afroben. It is a full-throated defense of aristocratic privilege. These are, after all, the best people. So they deserve all of the, uh, all of the trappings of royalty. And um, <clears throat> the characteristics of that... Um, of that are uh, ultimately problematic because this is a weird position to put a largely white middle class English readership into where they are familiarized to the ideas of aristocracy where the well-constructed hierarchy of society is kind of a given and they can feel good about that. They can feel gratified about that. But it is also just a little decadent. There is in this whole first half of the book a, uh, a considerable um, focus on court life and on the luxury and kind of amoral or immoral decadence of it. You get um, 
<clears throat> you get a uh, a continuing focus on romance. Uh, if, if I can stretch that word a little bit, you get a continuing focus on the female domestic realm of the court, which is all, which is which is what Afro Ben was familiar with. You get a uh, a continual focus on uh, on the the scheming older king whose sons have all died, and he has essentially one heir, and that is Arunico. Everybody agrees Arunico is the best of the best. He is brilliant. He is handsome. He is striking. He is commanding. He is thoughtful. He's everything that he's supposed to be. He is notably characterized also as particularly westernized because he has a French tutor. Uh, he has a tutor who was, um, uh, I, I forget it there, but he has a tutor who uh, was from France and left for certain reasons. And the suggestion there, I would say, is probably that he was a French Huguenot or a Protestant of some form, and he was driven out by uh by uh by the catholic uh uh forces of the time but regardless one of the things that makes a runico special that signals to the reader that he is special is that he is educated in western ways he knew almost as much as if he had read much as if he had read much he cannot necessarily read on his own so he's still not quite as as good as the white man he had heard of and admired the romans he had heard of the late civil wars in england and the deplorable death of our great monarch charles the first royalist afroben making that case again and would discourse of it with the, all the sense and abhorrence of the injustice imaginable. He had an extreme good and graceful mien, and all the civility of a well-bred great man. He had nothing of barbarity in his nature, but in all points addressed himself as if his education had been in some European court. So she's really working hard here to say that he's essentially a European. He is essentially a white man. And again, you can look at that so many different ways. You can be offended by that and say, well, no, he, maybe he should be, uh, maybe he should be great in his own merits, great in his own way, and not great by somebody else's definition of greatness. And that is a very valid point. And critics tend to really harp on this point in, uh, in, in slamming this book. But if you look at it in concert with the established mode of these opening lines, these opening paragraphs, the opening pages, is that uh, she is, Afroben is still trying to curry the favor, trying to build the familiarity between reader and subject, between the comfortable middle class uh, white aristocrats or middle class arist or middle class or whatever of of England with this faraway black person and establishing that connection isn't a given and you can't just rely on vague notions of shared humanity. She knows she needs to make it very explicit to try and sell this to a skeptical audience who have largely dismissed everything non-European as barbarity. They are not particularly broad in their scope. Even the education that she is hinting at here that uh, Arunico got is fairly limited. Uh, he had heard of the Romans. Education in the Roman Empire and the early Roman emperors was a standard of British schools from, uh, from the beginning, quite frankly. They revered the Romans, especially in the era from the Renaissance and into now the Enlightenment. 
and the uh, you know oh wow he knows so much history he knows about the uh, the 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 assassination of King Charles the first that's taking place in like 30 years 30 or 40 years before this uh, this book is being written so it's not necessarily you know that obscure so it's a fairly constricted notion of what an educated person knows but again you have to look at it I would say as a bridge to that comfortable bourgeois is the dismissive term that comfortable bourgeois readership and this son, this grandson of the king is known to be okay he is the next king that continuity of government that continuity of uh of the aristocracy of the monarchy is a given uh but the king the current king is getting older now then we get this character introduced imoinda Orunoko comes back after training and after fighting. He is now a great general, and he gets essentially sent on a diplomatic mission to meet, or he does it more in a way on his own uh, volition, to greet the daughter of his old teacher. Again, another aristocrat, another privileged person in society and he goes to meet her and of course he falls in love with her and she's the most beautiful person in the whole world and she's wonderful and she's she's lovely and charming and engaging and all of these things and uh, and he, he comes away smitten because it's natural that when one aristocrat the son of a where the grandson of a king meets another aristocrat, the daughter of a uh, a, a great hero of some sort, uh, it's natural that they're going to fall in love, right? Because game recognizes game, right? Aristocrats are naturally better, so they match. Convenient. But the problem. Of course, there's always got to be a problem. And here we're getting into the melodrama. Is the old king eh, kind of wants that girl for himself. He hears the descriptions of her beauty. And he is intrigued. He wants some of that for himself. And this is essentially the plot at this time. An old, somewhat impotent, losing it mentally king falls in love with the, uh, a young girl, but the young girl has a lover, and they are conspiring in one way or another to get with one another because they are the natural fit as opposed to the old and infirm king. This is essentially King Arthur with Guinevere and Lancelot. This is essentially King Mark with Tristan and, and Isolde. This is a very well-worn, melodramatic plot line that is interesting enough and is serviceable enough to draw a reader in. But... When you're reading a novel, when you're reading anything, when you are appreciating any form of art, it's often not the surface stuff that matters. It's the stuff on the periphery. It's the stuff underneath and in between all of these details. And for that, for the heart of this narrative, the heart of this story, you look to the more obscure stuff. And there, I would say the poster child for the obscurity is a character named Ona Hall. Ona Hall is an older woman, and she is the opportunity for Afroben to give voice to her particular critique of society. And Ona Hall is probably the most well-rounded character of that, so she stands out more over and above the silly little stuff that's going on with the melodrama of these three characters, the king, the princess, and the prince. There. It's a secondary character. It's not necessary really to the primary plot. The story has gotten along very well with essentially these three characters so far. Arunico, uh, the Old King, and Imoinda. So suddenly we're being introduced to this new character who 
doesn't have a particularly big part to play. All she does really is uh, is essentially get the help the uh, help the young prince Arunico get into uh, the uh, to visit the young princess Imoinda behind the back of the old king. That's pretty much all she does. Certainly, a dramatist of the skill of Afra Ben could have made that happen pretty easily without dwelling on a whole lot of stuff, without, you know, wasting my time with a whole paragraph on this one character that nobody really cares about. Why would she do that? What is being conveyed in this paragraph? This Ona Hall, as I said, was one of the cast mistresses of the old king, and twas these now past their beauty. What does that mean? Well, eh, she's getting up there. Maybe she's got a wrinkle or two. Maybe the hair is starting to gray. Maybe, you know, that girlish figure is uh, taking on a bit more substance. Getting older. That were made guardians or governance of the new and the young ones. That's just harsh. Because look at the value being placed on physical attractiveness. Particularly a kind of sexual attractiveness here. Where these two characters, Onahal and Imoinda, both of whom demonstrate uh, a kind of intelligence that verifies them as actual human beings, but they're valued explicitly within their lives, within the court. They're valued explicitly for their physical attractiveness. And here Onahal is on the waning end of that. Onahal is getting older. Onahal can't rely on her physical attractiveness anymore, so she is training the younger ones. Like, okay, you're you're pretty, uh, and you got that cute little figure and all of that, so, all right, that's great. The king is going to really like that, but let me just explain a few things of how he likes things done. Onahal is being used for her intelligence. She is being valued for her intelligence in a way, but only as a kind of retreating action as her looks fade. And the implication is that uh, maybe she would trade a little of the intelligence for just the opportunity to cling to the attention she gets from being beautiful. Certainly nothing is more afflicting to a decayed beauty than to behold it in self-declining charms. It's tragic, almost. And think about Afra Ben, the female author of this story who is arranging everything and offering up exactly what she sees when she looks around the courts, the royal courts, the royal societies that she grew up in. She sees, you know, the pretty young things getting all the attention and the very smart more experienced, worldly women with wisdom to offer. And they're just being, you know, okay, you can be a handmaiden to the young pretty one. You know? <laughs> it is not particularly subtle. And yeah, it can be confusing to read because you're not sure what you're reading and what kind of a name is Ona Hall anyway. But this character 
is uh, very curious in the way she's being presented. And at the end, it's almost as if she is being painted as a villain because so much of what the first half of that paragraph reads, I think engenders some respect for her, engenders some sympathy for her, for Onahal. But then you get down to these ab abandoned ladies therefore endeavored to revenge all the despites and the decays of time on those flourishing happy ones. So she goes from being this somewhat respected, intelligent, capable woman of the court to being a kind of scheming harpy who's always looking to take it out on the younger girls that she's in charge of. So this grooming of the beginning kind of devolves into a kind of malicious catfight almost, which seems unfair, quite frankly. And you can argue about whether her actions, Onahal's actions, ultimately, uh, ultimately uh, benefit Imoinda or destroy Imoinda. Uh, you can make that argument a couple of different ways. But here, the tone of those last couple of lines of the paragraph seem to be coming down very hard on her with no actual evidence from her behavior. We're not shown her really scheming against Imoinda so explicitly. We're not shown that vindictive quality of her. But I have to wonder if, again, this is a split between the way things are that the author serves up as a kind of uh, 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 explanation of truth or a depiction of truth. Like this is the true, this is the reporting part of my uh, thing, but then I'm going to reassert my narrative role and tell you what to think about it. And here I'm going to tell you something very negative about it. I'm going to put an ugly cast on what this character is. And I'm going to make it just a little ham-handed. I'm going to make it just a little obvious that I'm doing that. So that you can separate very clearly, maybe even in, in this single paragraph, the difference between what you see and what you're told. Because what you're told might be different from what you see. And maybe you should trust your own inherent gift of reason, your own inherent value of your intelligence to deduce what you think about something rather than just relying on what you are told. That's the enlightenment coming out. That is everything that this book seems to be pushing towards. While it is cozying up to some of the bigotries and the presumptions of its time, it is also undermining them, it is pointing the way to something else. And so much of this first half of the book is about doing that in terms of gender, in terms of the female character going on here. Ona Hall is an intelligent woman. Ona Hall is an independent woman. She is no longer necessarily just the plaything of the king, but she's being kept around because she has value. She has the value of her intelligence and her experience and her ability to teach. These are all characteristics of an aging uh, courtier like Afra Ben, somebody who, is, who has grown up in a court system, in a royal court. But also there is a fullness of character there that you don't see so much uh, elsewhere. The character of Abowin, who is just the buddy of uh, uh, Runico, uh, is used as a kind of tool because Onahal takes a shine to him. And the ultimate meeting of Onahal, uh, or rather of Runico and Imoinda, is brought about because Abowin who's just, you know, a good uh, a good wingman in this respect, 
agrees to go and let himself be caressed uh, by Onahal. Onahal likes Aboin and wants a little something something behind the scenes and says, okay, you come with me and, you know, uh, I'll look the other way on what Arunako and Imoinda are doing for a little bit. But again, that that celebration of uh, an older woman's value, an older woman's sexuality even. She has a full character. She has a full life that the others can't appreciate because she's just dismissive as an old woman. So, so much of this early half of the novel is about recovering the objective values of the female sphere, the domestic sphere. So much of this is about that. When they have to shift over into the war towards the end of this section, they have a really clunky line, and the war goes on, or something like that. And it's awkward, because so much has been all of this backstage court intrigue of boudoirs and, you know, and, and whispers and, and professions of love all very coded female. So shifting back into the male world is a little herky-jerky. The contrast is being highlighted. The contrast is being emphasized. You are being told as readers, this is what to pay attention to. When something is notable, you lean in. When something is notable, you say, well, you know, what is that? When Ona Hall pops up as a secondary character, and arguably the most interesting character of all of them, uh, you got to ask why. Because, yes, there is a surface little story of the romance of these two figures, but it's almost secondary. Nobody really cares that much. What is important, what is important to the writer, to the reader, to the culture as a whole is what's going on underneath. What are the underlying dynamics being exploited and expressed here? What are the underlying dynamics of the society that are being called into question? That is what this novel is about. That is what arguably all of the great art of all time is about not just the surface happenings of a couple of characters doing some silly stuff on the uh you know on the stage but the the moments in between where the writer makes choices about what to emphasize and what to bring in and they'll keep the surface plot bubbling along there and it might be interesting it might not but what is really really interesting that is all going on around the edges and underneath. Keep that in mind as we move through the rest of this book.